Go on, kids. Nice to see David and uh, the family here this morning. It's David's farewell concert. <laughs> He's playing this morning. The other something about these farewell concerts, they keep having them. They keep having these world tour of farewell concerts. They keep coming back and having another one. So I'm quite sure we'll have another farewell concert from David when his time in jail comes up and he's, they're moving somewhere else where they might be going. I don't think they'll be in jail for the rest of the life. I just said so, you know, it's a season, it's a season for you in jail. But it's, a, it's like, it's the first step on the pathway of God for your life together. Yeah? Yeah? You're stepping out, if you need to. I just feel God wants to reassure you okay? that you might know that this is not the end of the journey. You're not going to go to jail for them be, be there till, till the end of time. Okay? You're going there for a season, and when that season runs out, you'll both know, you'll both sense very strongly our season is going out in this place. And then God will open another door for another season in a different place. And you might be doing something totally different to what you're going to be to do. There will be another season, another door, and another step. That's well. Like I said, David, enjoy your flying. It's a season. You won't be flying until you've got a beer down to your waist. <laughs> <laughs> enjoy it, David. Enjoy it. I feel this is really worth the world today. Enjoy it. Enjoy the season. I don't know how long it'll be. It won't be short, but it won't be long, long, long. It'll be kind of in the middle of something. But enjoy it. And when it comes to an end, just say thank you, Jesus, and move on with great joy to the next step in journey. God has to be done. Amen. Just says it could be another nation. So just put that on the show. Amen. Okay. So who's all happy today? Are we all happy this morning? Yes. Great joy in our hearts. <laughs> That's a great you a smile, that's exciting. <laughs> that smile at me. Oh, wonderful, Jesus. Okay. If you're just here with us this morning, you know, we'd love you to stay and have a cup of coffee with us after the service. There's a dining room out here. Um, it's not very big, but you can get split. They generally split outside onto the veranda. But please stay and have a cup of coffee. It'd be nice to say, get to say hello to you and just get to know you a little bit. No, actually, if you've got time to do that, you to do that. I find it inter interesting that, yeah, I feel, I'm going to emphasize, I really feel there's something special about that young lady, something special about you guys here today. I don't quite understand all that, it's full of spirit, it's a special day for all of us. Okay? Praise God. Right. something in the, there was a few thoughts that came out of that that, that sort of kind of quickened to me and uh, you know we all have a seed but we're born again we're born again by the, um, by the word of God which is the interruptible seed it's a precious seed and uh, in Psalm 126 verse 6 it says this you have your Bible with you this morning Read a couple of scriptures to you, I'll see a few thoughts for you. 126 verse 6 says, He that goes forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You know, when, uh, when a lady is, is, is pregnant, she carries a seed within her. It's a very precious thing. Carries new life within her. 
and uh, she is uh, very protective of that. She carried that seed to its full term, to full termination. In fact, she's, she, if women can be very, women will fight for their babies and fight for their, you know, they can, you touch my kids, look out. They guard their seed with great vigor, great enthusiasm, and great you know, determination that that seed will come to full, full age. And they, they, they raise their children. Um, they're, they're very protective. You watch them, even in the animal kingdom, the females are very protective of their, of their children, their, their offspring. And uh, God wants us to be as protective and determined of the seed that we carry within us. You know, we are all pregnant with the hope. And it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. We have a hope in us, and we need to protect that hope and carry it to the full term, that it might come forth and, be, and fulfill itself. And there's a, there's a general overall hope, but there's also a, a, a vision and a dream for each one of us. Each one of us has a purpose and a calling on our lives. But none of us is here by accident. You know, you're not just here by accident. You're not just um, filling up space. You know, we, we, we are people who are called to be on the, the cutting edge of life, making a mark. It wouldn't be terrible if at the end of your days you, you, know, you went home to be with the Lord and they, they, they put up this, uh, what they call the tombstone, and it says, He filled up space. <laughs> wouldn't it be terrible to have that on your tombstone with an epitaph? He just filled up space. It would be great to have. He made a mark for God. Or she made a mark for God. She left a mark for God in her community. She will remember for the mark that she made and left in her community. Wouldn't that be exciting to have something like that on your tombstone? You know, some tombstones are a, a memorial to a life that once was. They commemorate something that's, that's, that was alive once and now is dead. But we need to have something on our tombstone that commemorates a life that was, a life that now is, and a life that goes on into eternity. And we need to have a vision and a dream. And that seed that's planted within us, you know, um, and you might pick this up. Um, in First Peter chapter one, let's just go there, shall we? So we see that in the psalm that calls us very precious seed. So the seed is precious that we carry. And uh, Paul talks about one place. He said, "I prevail that you may be that Christ may be formed in you again." It's almost like they had the seed and they lost it, and he wants to be formed in them again. Well, I think we are, we don't lost it. We're down the end here somewhere. Good. Yeah, first bit, uh, first Peter chapter one. It's verse twenty-three. Being born again, not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. So there is a seed within us. It's a precious seed. We also can type like that to a dream. If you go to uh, Genesis chapter 37, you'll find there's a, down through the word of God, there's many men that had dreams and visions, and, but maybe the most, one of the better known ones would be, would be, um, this guy wants to go and find Joseph. In Genesis chapter 20, or just Genesis 37, this. Thirty-six. 37. And we find there's a couple of places here refers to it. In chapter 37, verse 5, it says, And Joseph dreamed a dream and told it to his brethren. And they hated him yet the more. Joseph wasn't popular. He was the, uh, the youngest son. Of, and uh, his father loved him. He was the youngest one. He was the son of his old age. And he gave him a coat of many colours. Remember he had a coat of many colours given to him? That's what his father gave to Joseph. And uh, we're sitting there excited, his, his brothers and his brothers. And uh, but Joseph dreamed a dream, and he dreamed. His dream was 
that he would be head of the show. He'd be in charge of it, he'd be the top man. And of course that didn't go down very well with the older brothers either. And so they said he dreamed another dream. So he dreamed a couple of dreams. But Joseph had a dream. And in verse 19 of that, or verse 18, we find that uh, Joseph's father sent him out and said, I want you to go out, keep an eye on the boys, and tell them what they're doing. Make sure they're doing a good job looking after the sheep. And, and you know, out there, they've got the herd out there of sheep, or uh, flock rather. They've got a flock of sheep out there, they bring them to different pastures. I want you to go out and make sure they're okay, and they're doing a good job with the, with the flock. They're really looking after them. And so Joseph was out, he was kind of like, um, in a way, he was spying on them. That's the way they looked at it. And so they thought, well, if we, we can. When he came, they grabbed him. And of course, we know the story, most of us familiar with it. They uh, grabbed him, tied him up, got him down a hole, down a pit. Fortunately, it was in the summertime, so the pit was empty, there was no water in it. Otherwise, they would have drowned the little fellow. And uh, if you read the story, you'll find that Joseph went from, 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 it's almost like he went down and down and down. He went from the pit to the slave, from the slave to prison, and in the prison, he finally got a couple of guys there, there was a baker and a butler, and he, they had a dream, they each one had a dream. You know, look, and uh, the poor old butler, his, his the baker brother, his dream was that, um, Things weren't going to go too well for him. Actually, in fact, when Joseph interpreted the dream for him, that he was going to be released to take out that honey, which wasn't always the kind of dream you want to have. And uh, but the the butler had asserted that he would be restored to his butlership. And of course, Joseph said to him, "When you when you come back into that place of uh, of honour, remember me." Now remember me, now the little guy here, I'm the one that told you it's going to happen, remember me? And uh, the story was that he didn't actually remember him, and two, four years went by. Ever felt like you've been forgotten, you've got a dream and it just hasn't been happening, it's not working, and you think, well maybe God's forgotten about me. Maybe he doesn't, he doesn't remember where I live anymore. Anybody ever felt like that? It's sort of like they literally went to come to a standstill and nothing much is happening. And, uh, and after two four years, we'll read a bit first in a minute, but we'll just put, actually we'll read it now. It's in Genesis 41. A few chapters on, he's been, he's been going through a bit of a rough time for old Joseph, you see. And I want to encourage you this morning, because some of these people, some of you guys might be going through a bit of a rough time. And you might think, well, God's forgotten all about me, and it's never going to happen. And what's gone wrong with my dream? What's gone wrong with that seed thought that God sowed into my life when I first got, when I first gave my life and my heart to Him? It was like everything was, everything was wonderful. Everything, I just had to ask and it just sort of dropped out of the sky. It was just so great. But it doesn't seem to be dropping out of the sky anymore. It doesn't seem to be quite as great as it was back then. And it doesn't seem to be happening the way it used to. And then we get to telling Joseph was brought out of prison. Because Pharaoh had a dream. There's a whole lot of dreaming going on in this, this story. We're all having dreams all over the place. Who has dreams? Who has dreams? Who has dreams and visions of the night? You know, a dream, the Bible says, is a vision of the night in the book of Job. So, you know, you need to take notice of your dreams. But remember, that not all dreams come from God. Sometimes you, your dreams come because you've had too many cheese biscuits and these biscuits and chocolate biscuits before you went to bed. And uh, so you've got to realize, you know, you've got to be able to discern the dreams that come from God and the dreams that come, come, come because you had too many chocolate biscuits before you went to bed. And so we, we need to see that. And we need to find, hang on to the dreams that come from God and be able to discern them. And so these guys are all having dreams. And of course, we know Pharaoh had a dream of the, 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 the fat cattle and the thin cattle and so many happy years were going to take place and, and he didn't know what's going on. And, and the, yeah, all the magicians and all the wise men of the court tried to interpret the dream and they couldn't interpret it. And then the butler suddenly remembers, he said, there was a guy in the prison who told me my dream and it came to pass. And so... They, 
suddenly Joseph comes to the forefront. And even though he's had this vision, this dream all these years, suddenly he comes to the forefront. And he gets, his dream comes to pass. And within a very short period of time, in verse 37 it says, uh, chapter 41, verse 37, it says, uh, And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh, in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a man as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. And so we find that suddenly he gets to be number two in charge in Egypt. Just overnight like that. Suddenly he's number two in charge. And his dream comes to pass. And if you go back to chapter 37 and verse 19, and they said one to another, Behold, the dreamer is coming. Remember he came down. Come now therefore, let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some evil beast has devoured him. And we'll see what will come, become of his dream. And there's a very well known man, Mark Luther King, who was uh, a shot. He was a civil rights leader. And he had a dream. And he got up one day and he preached and he declared, he said, I have a dream. And they thought if they just knocked him off, they got rid of him. The dream would go. But see, dreams continue on. And if one person lets go of the dream, God raises up someone else to pick up the dream and run with it. And we have to be a people who hold on to our dreams. And dreams come in seed form. The dream is not the fulfillment. The dream is just the seed. But we have to guard the seed. Guard the dream. And run with it so it might be fulfilled in our lives. I want to give you five things that can rob you of your dream and take away the seed. Number one is worry. What if it wasn't God? What if it doesn't happen? What if? What if? What if? You ever had a dream and you said, oh, what if it's not God? What if it doesn't happen? And you worry. Worry about other things can distract you from your dream. It can distract you from the call of God that's on your life and from the dream that God has given you. And you can get caught up in all sorts of things and you can lose your dream. I had a friend once, I knew him reasonably well, he used to come to our house we were in, in a little place called Rahadu. He had a dream once. He had a dream that he would go to be a missionary. God called him, he was a he worked on the power dams in New Zealand. They were building all the hydro dams over there at that stage. We're going back about um, oh, 40 years now. And his name was Lindsay, who was, and he uh, had this dream of being a missionary overseas in South America. And nothing seemed to happen. And uh, if he hadn't got saved, he was just thinking very seriously about joining the Communist Party. That was his next step, to join the Communist Party. God saved him. And he got this, he gave him a little book called The Seal of God. And if you come across that, it goes through all the different things. Now, God seals on creation and nature and all sorts of things. And even in, in numbers, right through the Bible, it's very interesting the book. And uh, he was sitting in a little church one day, he got married, and they had a couple of ch and some children. And everybody thought, well, poor old Lindsay, it's all over now. He's settled down, got married, got some kids. The dream's gone, he'll never get to be a missionary anymore. It won't happen. Nothing's going to change. It's not going to come to pass. And then one day he was in a little church somewhere, in the middle of North Island, I think it was. He was still working, I think, on the, on the hydro projects. And uh, he was actually an agitator for the labour movement, stirring up trouble, causing strikes. That was his job, that's what he was supposed to do. And uh, he. Uh, was in this little church and somebody preached a certain little message similar to what we're talking about this morning. And he said, is anybody here that has a dream that hasn't been fulfilled? I want you to stand up now and we're going to remind God that you're still waiting for your dream. And you're still carrying the seed that hasn't come to birth yet. 
And so he stood up. And within about three months, he was in the Argentine, in a city over there, as a missionary. He'd approached all the missionary societies, not one of them would pick him up, not one of them would look at him. Within a short period of time, God picked him up. And suddenly, it all happened. He had one of God's suddenlies in his life. But see, we can't let go of our dreams. We cannot drop the seed. We cannot abort the seed that's within us. Abraham and Sarah, when they were old, they had a seed. They had a seed in their old age. And they saw it come to pass. They, they carried the dream for years. God said, I'll give you, I'm going to give you a seed. I'm going to, you're going to have a seed as the stars of heaven and the sand of the seashore. That sounds like a pretty big sort of family, doesn't it, have? And, uh, and nothing happened. I mean, they must have been trying for a long time and it just didn't seem to want to work. And then finally, God stepped into the picture. I think Abraham was 100 years old. Sarah was, was, she was 90, she 90 and he was 100. Something like that. And suddenly she got a new spring in her step, you know. Something must have happened because all those kings around the place, they, they, they had their eye on it and she, they must have seen something. I mean, you don't usually chase 90-year-old ladies around, or do you? I, mean, I don't think you do. I haven't seen too many 90-year-olds that I want to chase around. <laughs> Not that I'm interested in chasing anybody around. I've got, one, I've got one to chase, that's enough for me. And uh, this 90-year-old lady, and of course, Abraham was, uh, you know, he wasn't looking too good at 100. He might have been hopping around on the step, you know. <laughs> You're not the sort of guy you want to be taking over and introduced to your mother. <laughs> you know. But God stepped in. And the seed, or the dream, became a seed. And the seed became Isaac, the son of promise. Praise God. So age doesn't come into it. It's a faith thing. You've got to hold on by faith to your dream that the dream might materialize into a seed and the seed will grow into reality and you'll be into, you'll be into the very thing that God put in your heart in the first place. But see, worry can rob you of it. I wonder how many times they worried about it. I wonder if Abraham worried about it. Oh, this is terrible. No, this, he's never going to get pregnant. We're supposed to have this son. And it's never happened. We've been at it for a, a hundred years now. It doesn't look too hopeful. <laughs> you know, Sarah's thinking, well, I'm a bit old now. I'm trying to pass it. And, and we had this promise and it's not happening. And I don't know what I'm going to do about it. They're going to be, most probably there's a bit of worry in there. They were worried about the, the, the outcome of the promise. How was it ever going to happen? Pastor Dave, he did lose the dream. He went into Hagar. Yes, well, that was, that was her idea. <laughs> now we've got the Arabs because of it. <laughs> That was, that, was, that was his wife's idea. She tried to help him out. <laughs> she said, I'm not doing too good. Have, take, the, take my hand, mate. We might be able to do it another way. That was the answer of the flesh, wasn't it? But the answer of the spirit was to come through Sarah. <laughs> Praise God. Good thought, there, mate. <laughs> and uh, so we see, worry can rob you of your dream. In um, what if, what if? John 14, 1 to 1, chapter to what? John 14, verse 1 says this. We're going to time. Oops. It's moving on, isn't it? I'll have to sort of speed up the pace of that. John 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So the Bible says, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't worry about it. Just rest and believe God and it will come to pass. The second one that the thought was was that money, money can rob you of your dream. It's very easy to get sidetracked with dollars. The Bible talks about in Luke chapter 4, 8. I'm just going to give you a couple of scriptures. There's nothing wrong with money. 
If you keep it in the right perspective. Nice to money. What's one guy said? I've been, I've been rich and now I'm poor. Rich is better. Luke 8. No. You don't boast about it, do you? You just uh, find the middle ground. Mm. At verse 4. Deceitfulness of it come in and sidetrack you. <coughs> it's a bit hard sometimes in business, isn't it? You can get so caught up in that. It's like we got a merry go round. I know what it's like. We like, had in the business in New Zealand and there was a time when it's like being on this merry go round and it was going round and round and round and going faster and faster. And it was, would have been so easy just to got caught up in that because we had all this work coming in and we had to get it done and we had to do it. And I just had to step back at one stage. I felt one night, I remember one night sitting down thinking, Dave, you've got to stop and revalue where you're at. Because I couldn't even sit down after tea and rest. I had to go back out to work. Because I had just such this such pressure was on. Get, you've got to get the work done. You've got to get the job done. And I just had to reassess where I was at and what I was doing and get it back into the right perspective. And once you do that, keep it on track, it's fine. But that's the secret, doing that. Okay, money, a troubled heart, cares of life, John 41, that knocks your heart in trouble. It's that worry in that, they kind of very close, aren't they? The ridicule of others. In Nehemiah 4, chapter 4, Joseph had all the ridicule. His brothers were ridiculed him. David had a lot of ridicule. Remember when David went up to that battle? They were in the battle there with, with, the, with um, the giant. And he came out in the morning and roared across the valley. He said, Who hey, come out and fight with me, you bunch of pussies? <laughs> you're, all, you're just a bunch of pussies over there. <laughs> and, uh, and when David went up, he said, What's wrong with you guys? And they all ridiculed him. He said, Who do you think you are? You're just a little boy. Said, Go home and get back to your sheep. They backed those few sheep out there. And then in chapter 4 and verse 1 it says this, But it came to pass that when Sambalat heard that we built the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren in the army of Sambalat and said, Why do these feeble Jews, these feeble little, these funny little fellows, will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in the day? Well, they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish which are burned. Now Tobiah and Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox goes up, it shall even break down their stone wall. So here's people coming off, and they were ridiculing them. They said, You'll never make it. You'll never get there. You're wasting your time. Have you ever told somebody your dream, what you want to accomplish in life, what your dream is? And they said, Oh, well, well, you'll never do that. Nah, you'll never get there. You're wasting your time. It'll never happen. You ever somebody come along and did that to you? If it's God's little, God's little helpers, I call them God's little firemen. They come along with their bucket of water, throw their bucket of water over your dreams and try to put the fire out. And we need to get more fire to their dreams and reheat them and fire them up and keep them fired up. Ridicule, the unbelief of others and delays. This is the last one. So there's worry, money, troubled heart, ridicule of others, and delays. And if you read the story of Lazarus in John, 
chapter 11, one, verse 1 to 44. Remember how Jesus, they said to God, your friend Lazarus is, uh, is, is sick. And the disciples said, we better go. And Jesus said, no, that's right, we'll just hang around for that too. Keep it right, we'll be okay. Don't worry, we'll be right, we'll, we'll get there. And of course, he delayed his coming. And the sisters, when he came, they said to him, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. If you'd come earlier, where were you, Jesus? I thought you were our friend. You could have come down a couple of days ago. And he wouldn't, we wouldn't have had to pay for the funeral service. And he, he wouldn't have died and it would be, everything would have been fine. And of course, we know the story that Jesus then went to said, I'm, a, you know, I'm the resurrection and the life. Delays. Sometimes delays can cause our dreams to die. We have to learn how to handle the delays. Because when Jesus came, he brought resurrection and life into Lazarus. Remember, you get to the, you went to the, uh, went to the, the graveyard. He stood at the gate, yelled out, "Lazarus, come forth!" And Lazarus came out of the grave, and he said to the disciples, "You loose him." And he, they wrapped the grave clothes, they loosed him, and they let him go. And he was uh, released, and there was great joy in the house. But see, that delay had almost robbed them of their dream of healing for their brother. Because they knew Jesus, they knew he went around healing the sick. But maybe there's just the odd one that had been raised. And they forgot about the ones that got raised, they just remembered the ones that were sick and got healed. And then he said, well, yeah, if you'd been here a bit earlier, our brother wouldn't have died. We know, we know you. We thought, we, were, we thought he was your friend. No, if he was your friend, surely he would have come. And so the delay almost robbed them of their dream and their the way, the admiration they held Jesus in. But then when he came, of course, the delay worked and there was a far greater impact when Lazarus came out of the tomb than if he just got up off his bed. Greater impact, wasn't it? Just imagine if, uh, if um, one of you guys uh, you know, died tomorrow or got real sick this week and, and you were lying on the bed and well, okay, the elders came around and prayed for you and went you with oil and you got better. We'd say, oh, we had a great healing in the church. But if one of you died and we were, we were having a, a, a few days of my life about to have a funeral service and then we just came and we called out to you, Charlie, come forth. <laughs> and Charlie leaps up out of the grave, out of his, jumps out of his coffin, and uh, that would have an impact. That would have an impact, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I remember a guy preaching once years ago, he was doing a tent campaign, and he preached on Lazarus. He had this guy in a coffin wrapped up in the toilet paper. He was just standing there, the coffin's up there, standing inside the coffin with the toilet paper around him. And he said, he, he talked about it, he said, you know, they, they explain everything. But they, the, the, the sister said, but Lord, he stinketh. And uh, you know, all the kids in the front row had these little stink bombs. And when he said, Lord, he stinketh, they, they let off the stink bombs and they wafted through the tent. And then it was a real, real, it was a real powerful aroma that came through. <laughs> And he said, you know, they can explain everything else, but they can't explain the smell. But there wasn't any. <laughs> we were all sitting there holding our noses. And he goes out, and Adam has come forth, and the guy leaped out of the coffin. And, you know, I remember that. That was a sermon that was preached 30 years ago. Amazing, isn't it? Some sermons you will never forget. So we, we need to protect our dream. We need to nurture the seed. The dream turns into a seed and the seed becomes a reliving reality in your life and my life. I'm living a dream. 
I'm actually living a dream. Part of the dream that I have, I'm living it right now. Praise God. I'm living my dream. Are you living your dream? Are you waiting for your dream? Has worry robbed you of your dream? Has the deceitfulness of riches got you so caught up? You've forgotten about your dream? Have you, are you troubled in your heart? The cares of life cause you to have much trouble and worry? Have you been ridiculed by some of your friends and said, oh yeah, ah yeah, go on. Go on, you'll never, you'll never make it. You'll never get to do that. Who do you think you are? You know? Have delays. Have you had some delays? Have the delays caused you to lose heart for the fulfillment of your dream? Praise God. Well, if any of those things are your problems this morning, if any of those are troubling you, if any of those things are, 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 are causing you to lose heart or lose your dream, I want you to... Can we all just stand up for a moment with those? You know, there's a scripture that's been going over in my mind the last week. It says, all things work together for good. What's that, say? Romans 8, 28. I've been told this. All things work together for good. But you know what? Not all things are good. <laughs> Some of the things we go through are not good. But God causes them to, even the bad things, God turns, turns the bad things for good. And if these delays, some of the things we talked about this morning, worry, deceitfulness of riches, trouble in your heart, if you've been ridiculed, if you if you going to deal with delays, and you say, well, God gave me this promise 25 years ago. Well, Abraham was hundreds of years waiting for his dream. So you're not doing too bad, are you? coming, your dream's coming. If that's you and you haven't seen the, the fulfillment, if you're just seeing a few signs, it's getting close for your dream to come to pass. If you're just seeing a few signs, then now's the time. Turn to God. Say, Lord, I'm still waiting. I don't want to worry anymore. I don't want to have the deceitfulness and riches rob me of my dream. Lord, your word says, let not your heart be troubled. Help me not to let my heart be troubled. Help me to put those, those ridicule things, those negative thoughts that people have sown into my life, help me to put them aside and just bless them today. And Lord, there's been some delays. I want to remind you today that I'm, I'm still waiting. But if you all close your eyes, I want you to do something. If you find that worry has been a problem for you, just put your hand up. Okay? That's been your problem, put your hand up. If you find that the, the riches or the, the quest for more money and more money and more money has been a problem that's robbed you of your dream or kept you away from the dream that God gave you, maybe a short time, maybe a long time ago, I'm not, saying it's, I'm not saying you shouldn't have money. I'm just saying that sometimes money can be deceitful and can rob you of your dream. You get so caught up in the money, you get the dream. That's you. We've all got our eyes shut. Just put your hand up. Okay? If you find that your heart's been troubled, with lots of things. You've had lots of things to face, which is called your heart to be troubled. Just every day stuff that keeps coming against you. Just put your hand up. If you find that people have put you down and ridiculed you and said, oh, you'll never make it, you'll never be a success, you'll never do any good. Why have been a teacher way back when you just go to school? That's held you back. Put your hand up. And if you if you've been your dream has been delayed, but my friend lends it over a period of time. Put your hand up. Say, Lord, I'm here. I'm still waiting. I haven't forgotten. You gave me a promise, Lord. 
You gave me a dream. You gave me a seed. I want that dream to turn into a seed, to turn into a reality. That's me. That's you, really, those one things. We're going to pray this morning that God will cause your dream to come into reality. And there'll be a suddenly over your life. Father, we just pray this morning, for all those who have their hands raised, that there might be a suddenly will come. Lord, you love suddenlies. Let there come a suddenly on each one that has his hand raised. And that let the, the, the situation is attempted to rob them of their dream. Let it disappear now. In Jesus' name. We just command those things to, to disappear off their horizon. And they will see the fulfillment of their dream. And Lord, we don't want to, want to be like Abraham. We don't want to wait a hundred years, Lord. We, we, we say, let it, let it come. And let it come quickly, Lord. Father, we, we're ready now. I feel I'm ready for my dream to come to pass. Father, we just pray for everyone this morning that has their hands raised. Father, let the dreams come to pass. Let the dream turn into a seed and the seed be birthed in reality in their lives. Father, we ask that now in Jesus' wonderful name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Praise God. Lord bless you. Great having you in church with us this morning. Have a great day. Have a great week. Um, the guys will be here tonight. We'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock. you are free to come along. We'd love to see you. And great having you with us this morning. Thank you for coming. It's, it's much more fun when you all turn up. And we've got to appreciate that.